only technology go, we're still enhancing on it. So for those who are online, you probably can't see us yet because of the, the way that we are managing the accounts. Maybe by the time I sit down, I can get the in-room camera going so you can see us. Um, my name is Kwan. I'm the chair of PCS Bedford. It's great to see some of the familiar faces and quite a lot of new faces. Um, and of course, we don't necessarily see all the people online. So we hope we'll have people from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, um, Silicon Valley, um, Mauritius, China. Those were some of the countries that we have external participants during the COVID period. Um, but we don't know exactly where you are today. And I'm not looking at the chat right now. So sorry, can't actually see everybody. Um, but, but we'd like to be able to connect up and join you. Um, as a little bit of introduction to those of you who do not know the branch very well, um, we are the local group that organize activities around Bedford and surrounding areas um, for the British Computer Society. So this is, is one of the, well, the only chartered body, not one of the only chartered body for IT professional in the UK. And according to the latest statistics, we have 70, 80,000 members all around the world. But this is Bedford, focus on the activities within the Bedford and surrounding areas. So for us, it would cover the whole of Bedfordshire, Milton Kings, to the east, we go halfway towards Cambridge, um, and so on. So that's, that's our geographic area. And we're really delighted that we can begin to get back into the hybrid meeting. Um, for those who are in venue, um, we used to use this hotel, it's convenient. So if you have parked your car here, please make sure you register your car at the counter. The meeting is free. We don't want you to pay a hundred pounds for your parking. And in terms of facilities, we have some water here. The arrangement we have with the hotel is that we can draw tea and coffee from the machine across the lobby. Um, normal booking is that we have some cookies. I think Severio is out there trying to sort that out for us. Um, but with COVID, change of people, short of staff, we know that discontinuity that, that we are trying to work through. So, so those are the, the in-person attendance the benefits that people can have. For those who are online, I'm afraid you need to sort out your own coffee and biscuits. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the meeting is recorded. So if you feel that you don't want to be in the picture, then um, if you're um, in the room, then maybe stay at the back so the cameras will not catch you. It's a camera at the back that I'm trying to activate. And then for those who are online, then probably not switch on your camera. Um, and, and in terms of Q&A, we'll be driving in primary full ch chat. So I'll be monitoring the chat when George is going through the explanation. So we'll try to then capture the Q&A for those who are online um, after the presentation and discussion. Anything I forgot? Uh, I think that's, that's very much for tonight. And um, just put in the plug before people may disappear early in the, in the meeting. Um, the local branch have been running for quite a number of years, apart from the professional meetings that when we get back into the rhythm, we aim to be able to do it. Um, roughly a professional meeting once a month or once every two months with this venue. But in addition to the professional meeting, we have a strategic um, program that have been working with the local school around enhancing the computer education in the local area. So if you are parents or French parents, um, from what we know, computing education in our local patch is rather poor. So to encourage those um, that improvement, we've been running a school's computing coding competition since 2013. And we've finished the collection of the submission. Now we're going through the judging process and um, there'll be a prize presentation meeting in Franklin University on the 6th of July, which is actually next week. Um, so, so that's some of it. But if you have missed this year's opportunity, then Please, if you have young people in school, encourage them to be able to do something and get better. The school system in UK is seriously under pressure. 
the head teacher, the teaching team have priority on the core subject. Computer science is not a core subject. So when they run out of resources, it tend to kind of fall by the wayside a bit. And worst of all, a lot of the computing teachers in schools do not necessarily want to teach computer science or computing as their first choice. It's just that the school don't have anybody, so they end up doing it. So their own personal confidence and competence in delivering and making right? and engaging for the children is not always easy. So anything we can do to help the teachers, the head teachers, as well as the children to enter would be very important. Otherwise, in a few years' time, we probably don't have people as BCS members. Worse still, we don't have enough people to run the cybersecurity desk and all the IT services. And so anything that you feel on an individual basis, you can enhance the community engagement would be really, really very good. And that's something that we do. I need to catch up with the email. Before COVID, we have a regular rhythm that in the summer, we have a family fun day organized in the Museum of Computing in Bletchley Park. Uh, we've lost that during COVID, but I was talking to the museum director this afternoon. I think David is on the call, our treasurer. We'll try to, our very best to make it happen in August. So the event is heavily subsidized by us, so that within is typically on one of the weekend days that those of the professional can bring the children and family into the Museum of Computing, the program layout that will help people who are interested in the computers, the colleges to, to work around it, but also the young people to have activities and games that can help them to engage as well. But you have to watch um, our website for the news because um, we're hoping to get it going. Don't have all the details yet, but that would be something that again is another piece that we hope we'll be able to bring computing closer to the community. Right, enough of the plug. So I'm going to pass the time to George, who is um, a, one of the committee members, a good friend who have been doing quite a lot of things with us uh, recently, but he's also a great computer expert. And the thing that he's trying to do for us today is this topic of chat GPT. And um, I have to confess, I have not had an account, I have not tried it. I'm on the defense side as a lecturer in Cranfield University to try, try to ensure that students do not use chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> so working through how it's going to work is going to be interesting. So over to George. Thank you very much, Fan. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, joining us this evening. Um, my name is George Yazigi. I'm Digital Systems Manager at Jartec, Cranfield University. Um, I'm going to start uh, basically sharing an interactive session with ChatGPT. Those of you who are familiar with the technology, this is a um, user account that you could basically uh, sign up for. And I'm going to share this uh, particular, uh, just to, to, to make a little bit things more interactive, and then we move to the, to the uh, talk. So, as you can see, ChatGPT is owned by uh, OpenAI, um, which is a company that um, um, has been heavily criticized in the past few, uh, I would say, weeks or so. Um, so, um, one of the questions in the um, chat GPT is to ask um, it, because it's a machine, um, about who is uh, its boss. So, one of the uh, questions, who is your boss? So, chat GPT would um, uh, continue. And then immediately it answers. You can see that uh, ChatGPT would um, answer uh, interactively in real time, but sometimes it experiences certain hiccups because of the massive amount of, um, I would say, people who are um, connected to this uh, technology. 
So um, another type of questions, for example, what is your salary? <laughs> so then it, so we are talking about a new breed of conversational um, AI, artificial intelligence. And this new breed would uh, be based on uh, models, which I'm going to talk extensively about during the presentation. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this, this AI model is a bit old. So the cutoff date was back in 2021. So any events after um, the cutoff date would not, the, the, the system would never be able to, to answer. And then I, I'm going to get back to this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, limitation um, during the presentation. So another, uh, another question would be, um, would be, for example, uh, do you believe in um, compensation? So you, you try to, 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 to corner the, um, the system by answers that has already answered. For example, what is your salary? They mentioned, it mentioned that uh, it doesn't receive any salary or compensation. So do you believe in compensation? Let's see what would be the answer. Now it's taking more time because you see, yeah. Look, look. The answer is is basically hallucination, um, and hallucination is one of the features of of AI. And I'm gonna touch on hallucination in in uh, artificial intelligence chatbots. So uh, compensation relates to to human beings, yeah, but it has nothing to do with belief and personal opinion. Okay, so if we ask, what is your price? Yeah. So almost, the, the, we see that the system is a little bit cornered. It has repeated uh, a set of sentences from the previous uh, question. And this is where um, the system reaches basically its limits. However, if I, if I ask ChatGPT, generate for me a PowerPoint presentation about you. Now, has generated a presentation slides. But nevertheless, this kind of um, generation is a little bit, um, I would say, déjà vu. If you Google certain, uh, I would say, terms, you would find that on the internet. And this is where, actually, one of the sources of ChatGPT is coming from the internet. Another source is coming from some other corpus of text, which I'm going to touch on later on uh, during the presentation. So, um, um, predict whether in Bedford, England, tomorrow. Let's see what, this one is a bit tricky. Uh, of course, it is very tricky for ChatGPT to predict a weather system. It says, I don't have real time data. And the, this is where we are also touching on the limitations because ChatGPT may not be able to uh, predict without data. 
And all the data it has, has been trained based on data sets and input coming from um, a number of years up until 2021. So we are here basically touching the limitations of the system. Who is your competitor? <clears throat> Now it takes more time. Yeah. And then it states, you see that there is always a stanza or, or a standard cliche of answers which it uses. So this is also one of the limitations because it's speaking from previously fed information. And uh, who created you? <clears throat> I was created by a team of researchers and engineers at OpenAI. So this is fact information. Now, <clears throat> since it has said I was created, let us see whether it believes in creationism or evolution. Is it <laughs> 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 do you well you let's let's put a a tricky sentence you said you were created by open open ai are you a creationist or evolutionist this is one of the tricky questions, but as you can see, it has already a canned answer. <clears throat> so always it has repeated several times the same stanza. I have no personal beliefs, opinions, and ideologies. Okay. Uh, how to make a billion found GBP <clears throat> hmm. well it lectures you about innovation and disruptive thinking etc etc but still this is collected information it's not basically inferenced information or advisory information so um another type of questions um do you sleep okay so still it, it is it is stopping itself somewhere okay compose compose a song for me. Yeah. You see, these are the types of things that it can excel at. And yeah, it, it, it has just composed this song. And you could find several entries um, that are different. So if someone else would now joining us would ask the same question. It may compose a different song form. Okay. But I will explain why this is possible later on. So, mm, ugly song. <laughs> Do you have a better one? <clears throat> ah. So it created a link between my questions, because if the system does not understand that I was referring to the previous song, it, will, it would have never been able to say, I am sorry you or apologize you, if your previous song didn't meet our expectations. Okay. Is it now let's push it into British English? Mm -hmm. Is it apologize 
or Apollo Jais. Mm, sorry. So it has, it has actually given me the reference that in British English, we have S rather than Z. So um, other, other things we can, we can ask is, um, for example, do you, generate poems. Yeah, so it didn't jump into generating immediately. Some other uh, chat packages or chat systems would have the tendency to immediately generate the poem, the poem for you. So the question was also tricky in terms of semantics from a language perspective. Because when you do, when you say, do you generate poems, you are not asking the system to, to generate the poem rather than to answer whether they do or not. So some, some other systems would not. And even the previous version of, of ChatGPT, now we will, we will come to it, um, can also um, show you this anomaly that if you ask, do you generate poems? it will jump into generating the poem rather than answering the question. So there are certain limitations into ChatGPT, which I will be covering during the presentation. Um, I think we probably would move into the uh, talk. Um, do you have any special question you, will, you want to ask ChatGPT? Yes, please. Um, they say it basically learns. Yeah. The information either you give it or it, it's gathered. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle this into uh, during the uh, presentation. But do you want to ask the system a question? This was my uh, my yeah. If you have a question to the system that you wish to ask, yes, please. Are you a Pardon? Are you a Are you? Are you a threat? a threat to humanity? That's a good question. Yeah, it keeps on lecturing. Uh, in in previous versions, if you if you ask that that question and you push it a little bit, it would tell you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna terminate that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they have enhanced that uh, using the new new release. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing. We can we can come back to to the tool later on um, and share my my screen about the presentation itself. So okay. Okay, so what is the chat GPT? Is it, sorry. Yeah, um, so what is it? Is it a, ris a risky opportunity? Is it just an opportunity or a mixture of things? So basically uh, I'm gonna move a little bit uh, and uh, of course, I always present a disclaimer. This is not a comprehensive material about artificial intelligence. It's just for us to explore a little bit about the technology and to understand its implications. It's by no means a, uh, I would say, a, a course or an introduction to artificial intelligence or even chat GPT. So what are the contents? Uh, I'm going to cover the genealogy of the um, systems of AI chat robots and talk a little bit about DARTEC. DARTEC is our research center at Cranfield. 
We have Hilda Chat Rabot. Um, it's now training itself at the moment. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some jargons of the technology and the anatomy, et cetera, et cetera. So let us uh, have a quick look at the 40s in 1942. It wouldn't have been possible to break the Enigma code without um, identifying relationships in the textual messages that used to be sent by the Germans. So at Alan Turing, uh, he observed that each German message contained a known piece of a German text at a certain point. So he has actually observed that the, there was a relationship between the words, the position of the words, and a certain chunk of text. And this is how he was able to decipher it. He, he created the bomb. Uh, they call it the bomb. Actually, it was a very early system um, designed in, in Bletchley Park, not very far from here, um, to, to decipher the Enigma code. And it broke it. And this has enabled, really, the Allies to win the war in a great, to a great extent. So John McCarthy is basically the creator of the term artificial intelligence. He was the first person to, to use that terminology, and he is also the creator of LISP, which is a, an AI um, language, a computer language. So uh, Unimate was created by General Motors to, as an industrial robot, but this was a very heavy robot, and it was used to lift huge items or huge assemblies in cars. And it is not at all uh, similar to robots nowadays in the car industry. Eliza was basically the first chatbot. It was designed in 1964, and it was used by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as a psychotherapeutic robot to help people with psychological problems to, I would say, uh, enhance their life situation or well-being. So shaky or shaky, however you want to pronounce it, um, was really the first robot to perceive its surrounding in 1969. And Alice was the first national language processing, uh, natural language processing robot uh, or chatbot. Um, it was in 1995 and they, they use it extensively. And many of the features of ChatGPT are somehow based in, in certain concepts based on Alice, but don't quote me for this because ChatGPT uses a different technology, but some of the concepts. So Deep Blue was the first computer to beat Kasparov, to beat a human in chess playing. That was in 1997. Imagine how the frequency of enhancement in terms of um, the artificial intelligence, how things started slowly, so the jump between 1942 till later on. So there is there was a huge gap, and then the gap started to be smaller and smaller, narrower and narrower. Kismet was the first emotional robot. It would imitate your your face expressions somehow as well. So we we have also Roomba is the first robot that cleans and absorbs uh, dust. Siri, who, who, who doesn't know Siri in 20, 2008, it was the first uh, voice recognition assistant for mobile users. And initially, <laughs> not many people know this reality that Siri appeared initially on Google um, Marketplace before it was um, acquired completely by, by Apple. So um, we moved to Watson. Uh, it was designed by IBM as a Q&A system, and Watson is uh, based on natural language processing as well, and it is 
widely used in um, several applications at university levels and business entrepreneurial level. Alexa, who doesn't know Alexa? Alexa was uh, basically created by Amazon and it uses artificial intelligence. And one of the features of Alexa is that it has teachable skills. What does that mean? Is that you could add the skills using a special manipulation language without necessarily training. So you could imagine that you have a business rule or a database where you can store new skills. For example, turn on, turn on the light. This kind of, of skills could be teached or taught to, to Alexa directly, not necessarily by using um, extensive training. So Sophia was the first imitator of facial expressions and the first um, uh, imitator of language skills. So if you speak in front of Sophia, she would speak like you are speaking. And if you, and actually it acquired the uh, Saudi um, <laughs> citizenship as well. So it became, sorry, uh, it became the first robot to get a new different citizenship. So GPT, generative pre-trained transformer, one to four, and now we are talking about number five. So this is based, I will explain what generative is in a, in a moment, but this is how it started. We started in 2018 with GPT version one. We had 177 million parameters and I will explain what parameter is. Then we had jumped to 1.5 billion instead. Then GPT-3 in 2020, 175 billion parameters and 3.5 which we were using today is 350 billion parameters if we use the gpt plus but if we use the gpt normal which is the free version is roughly 200 billion parameters and then gpt4 somebody is talking about 170 trillion parameters that's huge. But OpenAI, the owner of the technology, is not conveying any value about the number of parameters. And then we reach BARD. BARD is Google um, equivalent of ChatGPT somehow, but it, used, it, it uses a different um, model, so language model for dialogue applications, Lambda, um, and, and it does not rely necessarily on the parameters concept. It has its own type of modeling. And finally, Dartex Hilda, which is Hilda Rabot. Rabot is not a mistake, it's not a typo. Rabot, it's research assistant bot. And it is directed for digital aviation. This is something that I started on, on Helda, our high performance computing environment. And it is based on an open source fork of GPT, chat GPT. So at the moment we have, we have, I have the plan to reach 384 billion parameters. Um, but for each phase, we take about 68 days for training. So this takes a lot of time, especially that we are using this on a, I would say, an operational high performance computer that is dedicated for research. So I cannot stop the computer or I cannot stop other users and just use it for, for chat GPT training or for Hilda Rabot. I consecrate a tiny space on the high performance computer environment in order to do the training. And the training is localized around digital aviation and aviation industry. So um, if you ask the question to chat GPT, for example, um, generate for me a, a presentation about you, 
uh, the the answer on on Hilda Rabot is is not going to be the same as ChatGPT at all. It it will probably say sorry, I don't have enough information for that uh, question because it is orientated and and it is the probably one of the first specialized packages into a certain industry and a certain I would say segment of the of the market which is aviation. Um, BARD, which is by Google, it is specialized in multimedia and, and social media. But uh, Rabot, Hilda Rabot, is specialized in digital aviation. And so some jargons, just to clarify things. So what, what is parameter? It's basically a weight. In, in neural networks, we talk about weights, how much weights we can put on the, on the network. And a network is composed of edges and nodes, as you can see here, Mr. Uh, George Washington. By the way, he has ancestry in Bedford, Mr. Washington. So if I put his, his, his photo here, I start by identifying light and dark pixels of the photo. So pixel is the picture element. And then I identify the edges. All these multiple hidden layers are basically unknown for me. This is the black box effect of machine learning or deep learning. And then later on, I start analyzing and I arrive at generating the word George for his name. So I always have in a deep learning neural network, which is mimicking the way the brain cells would work, but not exactly the same way, but somehow very similar. So I, I try to manipulate the information and create an input layer and an output layer. The output layer will give me the inference and the input layer will capture the data. The in, in the middle or in the between, this is all hidden for me. I don't see it in reality, but this is all based on statistical processes, algebraic processes and mathematical processes. So basically we are creating mathematical models into programs, into applications, in order for us to resolve these things. So this is what parameter is. Hyperparameters are user specific. For example, I can make some fine tuning. For example, I vary the batch size, or I can vary the learning rate, etc. And there are lots of hyperparameters for fine tuning purposes. But nevertheless, the important thing is the number of parameters which are the weights associated with each network. Tokens. Tokens is another fancy word for words, but not exactly, not quite. We are talking about here the word token. It could be a letter or a word or a combination. So roughly in 4,000 tokens, we have 3,000 words, roughly. Another example, when you, when you saw me entering the questions, these are tokens for, for chat GPT. So what is a layer? As I have explained, these are the layers into the whole neural network. And the layers can vary. For example, in chat GPT 3, which is the previous version that we, we tested today, we had 96 layers only. That is not too deep. We, sometimes at, at university, I, I run with, with uh, research students, uh, we run up to, let's say, 1,500 layers in certain extreme situations. But nevertheless, the number of data would be limited. But in this case, the number of data is huge and the number of layers is lower. However, the hidden layers are about 12,000 um, hidden layers. And this is what gives the, the, the need for processing power, excessively processing, excessive processing power. So uh, another jargon list, uh, what is generative AI? So a generative model 
um, is based on a neural network. We have seen what neural network is, and it is trying to identify relationships in order to create patterns. So if I have, let's say, weather data, I analyze the weather data and I try to see whether there is a, a relationship between um, altitude, uh, temperature, and humidity, for example, affecting other, other situations. And this is where we start creating correlations. And this is where the model can progress and start learning. So basically, we need data sets and we need to try to create the, um, the, the model using training techniques or training approaches. There are, uh, without going too deep into, into the training uh, understanding or, or the, the um, I would say, explanation about training, when we, when we talk about unsupervised, semi-supervised, or supervised, these are types of training that we use in machine learning. So um, I, I tend not to delve into details, but later on, if you wanted to, to ask questions, I'm happy to, to answer those questions. So at the end, we need to be able, and the, the beauty of the generative AI model um, is that it enables us to um, use multitasking AI applications. Otherwise, if I do not use that variation between unsupervised and semi-supervised and potentially supervised, I may not be able to create multitasking AI systems. And this is a, an essential part, multitasking, that means I can divide the same effort over multiple tasks. For example, the chat GPT was sometimes pausing and taking certain certain time to answer me because it was allocating certain resources to divide those, I would say, um, uh, to divide the, the given over different tasks. <clears throat> so another jargon is model. You, you heard me talking about the word model a lot. A model is none but a program a simple computer program which has mathematical, uh, I would say, connotations. And basically, we translate from mathematical model into program model in order to, to uh, analyze the data. So we start by cleaning the data and the word conditioning or curing or curating. We condition the data. This is the data curation phase. We label the data because if we have unlabeled data, we need to use a specific type of, I would say, um, training or uh, training approach. And then we need to augment the data. That is all the data conditioning or the data preparation phase. And then we go into the evaluation. We use different algorithms. Basically, in machine learning and deep learning, we have roughly about 270 to 300 algorithms available. But normally, most researchers would focus on these. At university, we use a lot of LSTM, we use DNN, we use lots of things. But nevertheless, there are about 300 different um, algorithms. And then we um, use the human-machine interaction before we arrive at the insight. So the objective of a uh, model is to give us insight or decision or help us to make a decision. So before that, we need some interaction with humans. That means the person who is researching need to see whether the data is meaningful or not, or the output is meaningful or not, before jumping into a solution. And this comes also at a cost, because um, nevertheless, we need an, a huge investment to do the training and collecting the data, um, manipulating the data and, and, and conditioning the data. But also we need that when we do the intervention by human-machine interaction. So basically, 
the concept of a model, imagine that it is a prepared meal for you. In term, uh, it's not like that, but to, to, to simplify things, imagine that you have a prepared meal for you that has already been cooked, that has already been, been uh, uh, prepared for consumption. And in this, in this somehow, I would say allegory, you could say that the model is some, something ready for um, consumption and the data that you are gathering outside the model is the test data. So I always have in any artificial intelligence paradigm, I have a test data against a model data. And this is where we need to, to understand the difference that, for example, if you do a training for weather information in the UK, it is unlikely that that trained model would serve um, somewhere in uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, or South Africa, for example, because the initial training data was different from the test data. So we move forward. Anatomy of chat GPT in five steps. What do I need to create something similar like chat GPT? This is what I actually did at university when I modified and forked an open source environment and created or designed Hilda Rabot. So we need eventually a computer language, which is the best is Python. We need PyTorch, which is a, a library in Python. I can download it and it's available for free. We need library for CUDA, which could be by PyTorch, provided by Torch or independently by NVIDIA, which is the company that manufactures GPUs. Um, and I need a data source. So what could be my data source? It could be Wikimedia, for example, which is the database of Wikipedia. All you, you have heard about Wikipedia, Wikipedia relies in the background on a database called Wikimedia repository. I can download Wiki, Wikimedia. The, the simplest or the smallest data set is about tera, eight terabytes. So eight terabytes is like having I think this, this laptop has one tera or half a tera hard disk. So yeah, all of Wikipedia is, could be uh, hosted on 16 like this in terms of storage. <clears throat> so later after the preparation of the environment, I need to pre-train the model. What does that mean? I need the large, we call it corpus, this is a Latin word, that means a large data set. And we need to create and understand the structure and the pattern in the language. So it is very important to, to highlight this reality because if I, for example, have mixed language, my model will fail. So if I have a corpus of data, let's say I have a text file, which is composed of English language and French language, I end up with a catastrophe, basically. I end up nowhere, even if I do whatever I can in order to correct that. It must be of the same language. And basically, I need a, um, to clean the data, like, like we have uh, indicated in here, the data conditioning uh, phase. And then I convert the data into an acceptable format so that I can feed it into my model. And my model is basically a computer program that's gonna detect the relationships and detect the um, patterns. So, and then I need to run a pre-training script to train that data. Now the word training has been mentioned over and over again. And here I have um, mentioned a little bit about that is the application of those algorithms, okay? 
So then we need to create a reward model. And this is something like an answer data set. Okay. Like I mentioned, ChatGPT was as if it was answering me from a library, but it's not, it was not a real library. But in here, we train a separate neural network. I have indicated what neural network is. And then we generate high quality responses. So, and this is basically the most tedious phase is to find the right answers for those questions and create that model for those, uh, I would say, uh, high quality responses. So if you imagine that the questions, the answers on Wikipedia are high quality, then you need to identify those as being responses. And this is where you need to use different techniques to segregate and to potentially clustering or other uh, techniques to, to separate the, um, the responses and see uh, and, and identify the quality of those responses. And then you need to um, uh, want to, 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 to feed that and, and, and train it again and again using a specific training script. So once this is done, we move to the reinforcement learning, which is the last phase before creating the cutoff date. So the reinforcement, the reinforcement learning is a technique in, in um, machine learning here. And the algorithms, one of them is reinforced uh, learning, you can see. This is one of the algorithms that we use. And the reinforced learning will help us to basically um, uh, fine tune the model, fine tune the answers, fine tune the parameters, because we, we're going to end up by lots of hyperparameters, which are um, user specified. For example, how many epochs I have to run that. Uh, that cycle, or how many, what is, what is the largest batch size, and all it depends on the infrastructure that I have. And then we start optimizing the performance and creating what if scenarios. And finally, we save the fine tuned model, preferably into a database, distributed database. And then we design an API like you have seen me doing on, on the browser. That was the front end API where I enter the text and get the answers. So that is in a, in a nutshell. And I apologize if I have been very boring about it because it goes into some of the technicalities. Nevertheless, let's move to one of the main questions. Is machine replacing humans? I would say yes, it is happening. It is happening as we speak. BT has promised by 2030 to remove 55,000 jobs. This is not easy. That is approximately 55,000 families. On average, if a family is four or five people, we are talking about a large number of people out of business. And here, it can, it can vary from layoffs to changes in the job roles to potentially opportunities for some. Those who are in the field, so, some would argue that computer scientists and software engineers are going to be laid off. We don't need them. No, 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 no. Think again. This is, this is the area where you need these computer scientists and software engineers the most. So that is not the case. But the, the issue is that we are going to face a crisis. And that crisis is not going to be um, in localized. It's going to be worldwide. And this is where we need to see which segments are going to be affected. According to studies, we are talking about most of the clerical jobs, most of the administrative jobs, most of the call center jobs, 
these are going to be extremely affected, basically turned off. So we, in, due to the globalization in, in the past 25 years or 30 years, and due to the um, acceptance of outsourcing, um, many companies used to outsource their call centers to, let's say, India, to the Philippines, to Egypt, and, and other places. This is going to be basically terminated. And we are talking about a humongous number of people that are going to be out of the job market. This is a true crisis. And, and we will never be able to understand its impact right now. We can predict some aspects, but we will never understand the impact until it happens. But the problem is that it's going to happen gradually and we will never be able to catch what is the exact impact of that, I would say, ripple effect. And this is where we will see um, industries or even countries who used to be prospering they go really into an economical slump. And this is where we need to be very careful. <clears throat> so what is the vel velocity of development? We have seen, and I have spoken in the past about Moore's law. Moore used to be at Intel, and he identified from observation that the technology <clears throat> ev doubles every 18 months. In, in AI, it goes 35 times every 18 months. It's not doubles, it goes 35 times. And this is based on proven data. And, and who's the source? OpenAI, the very, the very company that uh, manages and, and, and owns ChatGPT. So I think with this speed, Nobody is going to be able to catch up. Companies are flocking to this technology. They are flocking because they know it's going to save them humongous amounts of money. But nevertheless, there is a cost for that. The cost is not only in the investment that they're going to do in order to implement this technology, but the cost is going to be on the taxpayers later on. And this is where we need proper intervention from the governments in order to control this wave. And I call it a real wave because at the end of the day, it's gonna affect everybody. So how this technology can be abused? Um, I mean, there are lots of ways. Unfortunately, humans can use or abuse everything. Anything could be used or abused, to be honest. And chat GPT and AI is not an exception. We are talking about data privacy problems. We are talking about particularly impersonation. Imagine you, you end up by having uh, a call and you think that the caller is your son or daughter. Somebody is impersonating someone you love. And this could affect the elderly, because normally the elderly are affectionate um, and they, they are living probably in loneliness and impersonation can really attack them and, and cause a lot, a lot sorry, of, of problems. Hacking attacks. Imagine using this power, powerful technology. One, one of, the, of the users of ChatGPT asked the, 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 the chatbot, to generate and orchestrate a, a, a hacking attack on a company. It obeyed it. It, it, gave, it gave results. And he, got, he, went and he went ahead and used it. So we need to be very careful about how these hacking attacks could be orchestrated. Of course, the company, OpenAI, they have they have, for example, realized that this can happen. So they have disabled these things by parameterization, by hyperparameterization as well. So, but nevertheless, if a rogue nation, for example, acquires this technology, 
which some of it is open source. Um, and they can buy or outsource the hardware and they can start attacking other nations. What would happen? This is very serious stuff here. Imagine if this happens on military, uh, I would say infrastructure, which is really, it could happen anytime. Uh, cryptocurrency manipulation. Somebody was trying to manipulate the price of uh, <clears throat> the cryptocurrencies are available. We have, we have a dozen of them in the, in the market. And there was a huge, huge fluctuation in the, uh, in the market. And they were using a similar technology to do, to do that. Uh, deep fakes, you can generate a, a video uh, pretending to be, for example, myself, but I'm talking um, on behalf of somebody else. Um, I can impersonate using a deep fake presentation for example, the prime minister, and make him say things that he never said. And this will cause a problem. This is why uh, in the United States, they have a detector of deep fake of any video before they take any action. They go and pass that whatever video it is to the detector to, to say with a high confidence that this is authentic or a deep fake. Because you could, you could have, for example, Putin declaring war on, 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 on NATO, for example, uh, using a deep fake. I mean, this is an extreme case, but just, just an example to, to, to give you what could be and how could, be, how could this technology be abused. Password breaking. <clears throat> there are lots of softwares now you can uh, take them from, from the market uh, without even paying a dime, and they can help you to, to break uh, a certain password. Um, but with this technology, this could be really um, amplified tremendously. You could end up by breaking passwords instead of spending, uh, I would say, if we are talking about encryption, encryption should eliminate breaking a password with current technology. But with the advancement in, in the um, uh, AI, we could reach a stage where instead of waiting for hundreds of years to, or thousands of years to, to, to break a password, we could start thinking about probably days, weeks, which is still good in terms if somebody wants to break into a banking system or into a government installation. This, this should be really um, interesting to, to control. Uh, social engineering, somebody could um, pull a person to, for them to, to give personal data and details. And this works on uh, psychological misleading and also psychological manipulation, which is a subset of social engineering, but it could be used not only to, for you to disclose personal details, but also to disclose other types of details, not necessarily per, only person. Facial recognition using micro drones and those micro drones, um, you, you can't imagine, I, I didn't want to put a photo because um, it may not be very visible, but imagine that you have tiny flies and they can deliver a weaponized system to assassinate a person. I'm not talking science fiction. These are now being manufactured. These micro drones are being manufactured and there are lots of buyers. Nanotechnology, which can attack a genomic and genetic pattern in the bloodstream. So if we connect, for example, if you have a, an injection and that injection goes into the bloodstream and that injection contained nanoparticles, which could be communicating using a certain communication protocol with the AI environment, 
you could control the genetics of a person. This has a very good use if you are talking about medicine and medical discoveries, but it could be fatal as well. So other things, exploitation of hallucination to distribute malicious code. I'm gonna tackle what hallucination is, but nevertheless, imagine that hallucination, for example, one, one, one of the things, now they have corrected it in, in uh, 3.5. They used to ask uh, ChatGPT uh, uh, which year um, the Mona Lisa was uh, painted or, or, or created. Um, the answer was 1815, which is wrong. This is part of hallucination. And I'll tackle that in a moment. So somebody could exploit the hallucination issue in data in order to distribute malicious code. So you can send targeted malicious code to people. And this could be very, very serious thing. And others, there are lots of other, I, I don't wanna really spend a lot on, on this, but nevertheless. So what are the challenges and limitations? First of all, there is bias. I'll give you an example of bias. If you take a data set that is, for example, um, related to a religious group, okay, and you train that data set, all the answers are going to be skewed towards that religious group. So in other words, bias could also be linked to incorrect information and GIGO or GIGO or garbage in, garbage out. Because at the end of the day, the, the uh, system does not have self-consciousness yet, so to speak. I, I don't believe that these system these systems will achieve self-consciousness. However, I believe that there is a very basic level of, I would say, a, a projected consciousness. And projected consciousness is what we give the system as consciousness, but not acquired by the system itself. So if we talk about, if I give the system anything, if I give the system zeros, I will end up with zeros. That's for sure. If I take a, a corpus, a data set, made of a very long string of zeros, and I trained it as per what I have suggested, I will end up with nothing. So whatever I input, I will be getting an output. Okay? So bias is very important. There are certain situations where ChatGPT answered, for example, um, a biased um, answer about a religious, um, I would say, uh, person, or it answered a biased answer about a, a person of a different, um, I would say, background or, or race, let's say. And there are certain, there were certain accusations that ChatGPT is behaving in a racist manner. And this is where we need to be very careful as well, not to, uh, because whatever it has collected as data, it is going to produce as, as answers. And we can, we can test that and, and I can show you what, what I mean in this. And then hallucination, this is a, a reality, a mathematical reality in hallucination when we call when we talk about high dimensional statistical phenomena. Because if I'm if I'm controlling more than one dimension in, in mathematics, a dimension is let's say um, one vector, one one uh, one component. Um, a dimension is a width or a height. Okay. So if I have a lot of dimensionality, I end up by losing certain information at one point in time. And this would require more training in order for me to compensate. 
Because remember, in the cleaning phase or in the preparation phase, I need to condition the data. And I, I perform data augmentation. That means I am, I am supposed to create labels and to, to make classifications. But if I don't have enough data to classify, I end up with a problem in my dimensionality. And then I end up with hallucination. That means the system will send me wrong information or weird information. Incorrect information. And this is also linked with bias, with garbage in, garbage out, and with accuracy. And as you can see, accuracy levels in terms of um, percentages, they, they gave it to the uh, ophthalmologist, um, I would say, association here in the UK. And then uh, they they ma managed to to produce these these outcomes. You can see Chat GPT is only about fifty five percent accurate on the first experiment, and it was less than almost forty nine percent accurate. But when we moved into Chat GPT four. Accuracy was very high. So in reality, the system that we were using today, we were using ChatGPT 3.5. So in terms of accuracy, we are talking about 55%. Not unless we move into ChatGPT 4, which requires a humongous number of GPUs, a graphic processing units in, in high performance computing, this number of GPUs can exceed 10,000. And each GPU will cost you about 22,000 pounds. So if you do the maths, you know what type of investment we are talking about. So that is for GPT-4. But in terms of GPT-3.5, uh, there are certain, for example, if you see Bing Chat, Big Chat is provided by Microsoft and it is based on ChatGPT 3.5. However, it has achieved higher accuracy rates. That's because basically Microsoft paid money to OpenAI to enhance the um, input responses. You can see here when we talk about to, um, sorry to train a separate neural network in order to have high quality responses. They paid lots of money in order to invite people to work on designing the high quality responses in the, in the model. So this is where we, we talk about investment, how it can help enhance accuracy. But nevertheless, if we take it for granted, we are talking roughly 55 to 60% on the free edition of ChatGPT. And the cutoff dates, as I mentioned before, we are talking about all this data that we use today was conceived or collected in 2021. That was the cutoff date. After that, any event is not included and therefore the data will not be there and the answers will not be relevant. So what do we go from here? As you can see, I have created some sort of a, a situational awareness about um, ChatGPT and how we can use it in, in a good manner. I have told you about the problems that could arise and the real challenges and the limitations. And now we need to talk a little bit and this is my final slide about regulation, deregulation, and what would work the best. So I believe this kind of technology need to have a level of regulation. However, it is like security. Do you see security regulated anywhere? It's not. In reality, we have requirements for security, but we don't have a regulator for security as per se. And I think AI 
will end up in a way similar like security, not having a separate body, let's say this is the AI regulator of the UK, maybe it will happen. There are plans by the government that we, we will end up by having this. However, I don't see it moving at the, at, the, at the speed that we would have expected. Nevertheless, the main, I would say, driver would be ethical standards. If everyone using AI technology, and one, one of those technologies is ChatGPT, uh, there are lots of other AI technologies, we need to abide by a, an ethical standard, like uh, an honor code. Because if we do not abide by that code, the, the problem is really gross. We can end up with huge, huge issues in the future, especially if this technology is used by terrorist groups, for example, or rogue nations, or things like that. We need to be careful about safety issues. Uh, imagine uh, an AI uh, system controlling your car goes crazy and causes an accident. Safety issues are very, very important. Or if uh, we give the control, we have heard many times that an aircraft has an autopilot. Autopilot was not using AI in piloting the aircraft. But imagine that we put ChatGPT, for example, to pilot the aircraft, what would happen? Or even Hilda Rabot, what would happen? It could be infiltrated, it could be misused, like I have mentioned, there are lots of areas where abuse can happen and it could cause safety issues. So we need a level of regulation, but nevertheless, this regulation should not be a driving force to abstract innovation, to stop us from innovating. So we do not need to hire the, the ceiling, the, 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 the bar, and say and, and, and put a lot of, um, I would say, red, red carpet things in order to regulate AI. We need to be moderate. So my, my view is moderately um, <clears throat> regulated sector would be the answer. Because AI could control our psychology. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. If you are using Facebook, uh, or any social media, and suppose that that social media was controlled by AI. At the moment, it is not. There are certain, I would say, systems interfering in your social media, such as Facebook, but you do not have full control by AI. But suppose it was controlled by AI, and this system started to give you certain patterns that would affect your well being. We know for sure, for example, and the, there has been a lot of trials, that you can embed psychological pattern in music. You can embed psychological pattern in videos. You can embed psychological pattern in almost everything. So what if this AI system started embedding psychological patterns that are not detected by you, but affecting you? You may say, well, what, what is he talking about? And I'll give you just a tiny example, which was happening way back in the past. When Coca-Cola uh, wanted to market a new bottle, they started putting adverts for less than two seconds during um, the evening, several times. This has created a psychologically induced thirst. And people would go and would reach for a co bottle of Coca-Cola. If they didn't have it, they, they went and uh, down to the, to the off-license shop and, and bought Coca-Cola. 
So this was proven that you can visually induce a person to behave in a certain psychological manner. So this is where we can be very, we need to be very careful how AI can affect our psychology, especially that we are very much hooked on um, technology. And I mean, hooked on social media, hooked on uh, mobile phones, hooked on everything, <clears throat> everything digital, sorry. And then this comes where we, we talk about mind control issues. <clears throat> If somebody wants to affect your opinion and for example election don't you think that this is kind of mind control so this is where we need to be very careful it has already been used it has already been used and there are lots of lawsuits about this but they don't they don't attribute it to artificial intelligence rather than they attribute it to big data analytics but remember, artificial intelligence needs a data source. And the best data source for artificial intelligence is big data analytics. So this is where the relationship could, could erupt and could be very impactful. And then creativity issues. Our children, our students are generating their assignments on chat GPT. <laughs> That's not good. How about our creativity? Imagine I wanna, I ask ChatGPT, write me a poem. Or could you write me a poem? Or generate for me a presentation about you. It took me several days to, to, to produce this, uh, this presentation. However, ChatGPT generated the presentation, although it is not I would say compar to, comparable in terms of quality with what I have generated, but, but still it has generated something. <clears throat> and this is where we need to be very careful that our brain is many, many doctors and those of you who are medical doctors would agree that the brain is somehow um, always as allegory, not necessarily exact words, is like a muscle. If you train it, you get better results. And this is why we give children lots of exercises at home to, to understand mathematics, because they train their brain. If we stop using our brain, <laughs> what is the end? Where are we heading? Our creativity is going to decline. Our um, ability to think is going to be affected. Um, don't think about AI. Think about spell checker, which does spell checking as you type. <clears throat> and I bet you, if you go and disable spell checker, and write a paragraph of 200 words, probably you will end up by having 50 words with mistakes. But that's why you have trained yourself to rely on the spell checker to check the mistakes for you. But if you never use the spell checker, you will end up by having lower number of mistakes. And if we take that example, we can project it on how much AI is going to affect our lives in terms of brain activity, creativity issues, and I would say uh, information. So I think this would uh, conclude our talk this evening, and I'm happy to take some questions if you, if you have. <clears throat> When you was comparing that, that mortal two times every eight, eight, 18 months, there's a kind of technological development that chat GPT is kind of shown as 35x. Now, <clears throat> with chat GPT, is it because there was a lot of users using it and it was reintegration of that data that allowed it to grow or develop it like that? Or the 
because obviously some use are kind of using live things. Um, so what was the reason or how are they um, equating that development? <laughs> I think the the second option that you kindly mentioned. So, um, as you may have seen in in the synopsis, um, I was talking about the advent or or the use of high performance computers and the availability of the internet, <clears throat> because most of this data is collected from the internet. Most, okay. I wouldn't say all, but probably up to eighty percent of the data is collected from the internet. <clears throat> so, and the, I mean, I did my first master's degree in uh, neural networks, but that was in the nineties. Back then, I didn't have a GPU to train anything. So most of my research was theoretical and based on CPUs. And in those days, do, do you recall what was the speed of a CPU? It was 66 megahertz, 100 megahertz. I'm talking mega, not gigahertz. Nowadays, this laptop can, can reach four gigahertz of speed. And it has at least eight cores. That means eight I would say superimposed CPUs. So the, the ex, expansion, or the, in other words, the explosion of technology, which was Moore's law from the 90s till now, we are talking about a huge difference in the type of technology. I'll give you another example. When I, when I designed Hilda, which is our supercomputer at university, we bought NVIDIA, which is the company that manufactures GPUs. We bought the A100. I told you it costs about here in the UK 22,000 um, pounds if you buy it from a, a respectful supplier, so to speak. Um, but now we have the Hoover, which costs 55,000. Per GPU. But the hopper is almost four times much faster than the A100 or the Ampere. So, and this is in a, in, a, in a space of less than two years. So, this huge expansion in technology is causing this and the availability of data. Just one follow up question. So, are we at a stage where if you're using live um, data from the internet that they have shown that essentially you can use live data to skew results on the AI? Yes. Yes, absolutely. This is big data analytics. This is Cambridge Analytica, what the lawsuit of Cambridge Analytica. They use big data analytics to skew the opinion on social media. So, and, and as I mentioned, always we need a source data set. I cannot do all of this without data sets. And who's generating the data sets for me? They are basically coming from us. There has been a, an argument that OpenAI should not charge for chat GPT. Because they say it's our copyright. No, guys, it's not your copyright. Maybe the algorithms, <clears throat> but nevertheless, the data is our data. We should be owning the copyright. And this is where the democratization of data need to be tackled by the regulators when we regulate AI. Yes, please. Okay, so we do have a question from online. So because of the distance to the mic up front, I'll shout out the question. George, can you repeat the question again? So the rest of the people online know the question before you answer. Sure. So the question from David is that you talk about regulations. 
Is there anyone actually drafting any regs at the moment? Um, really doing it rather than just talking about it? Yeah, so the question is for our online community, is, is there anybody drafting regulations? Yes, I know in the UK, we have a body assigned by the prime minister to start developing a regulations uh, draft for AI. They haven't published anything yet, but there is a body already in place in number 10. And that body meets uh, regularly. And I think they are creating an advisory group to the prime minister as well on that on that subject. Just by a chat, he was completely incompetent, and the advisory group is a joke. But he's having a stomach in the autumn, and he'll get all the groceries with that. So. That's that's a political thing. Uh, I don't go into politics, but but as far as the question is concerned, the answer is yes. There is a a body um, now. Whether we end up by having regulations or not, that's a different story. Okay. Just for, for helping with procedure, for colleagues who are asking questions at the back, George, please repeat it for the sake of the online audience. Yes. Um, because the, the, call, the pick up radius of the mic up front is probably about a meter. Right, so what, what do you want me to repeat? If, if the lady asks a question. Yes, definitely, yes. Go on, go on, please. How is that going to work for competitiveness between countries when you have somewhere like Japan that has set copyright as well as like two data sets used for trading AI models? Right, so the question is how copyrights are applied in um, AI models, right? Uh, no, it's more like... You've got the UK looking to regulate, yeah. but then you've got Japan saying you don't need to respect copyright if you for whatever data sets you're using to train AI. Yeah. So one country looking to regulate, another one's going. Mm, this, uh, uh, yeah. So, so the question is uh, inter-country regulations. How that does that work? So basically, um, we go into international conventions. At the moment, there is no. Uh, such thing related to AI. So when we when we talk about, uh, for example, um, monetary uh, policies, and if a policy is applying to the UK and does not apply to another country, those who are signatories of a certain international treaty will have to apply that policy. And similarly, it's going to be applicable to, to AI. But at the moment, it's not there because it's something new. It's, it's happening at the moment. But of course, Japan can have its own laws. The UK will have its own laws. And any exchange will have to be governed by international regulations. So eventually, we will have a small group here in the UK, another group in Japan, and a worldwide group that will coordinate the efforts. And those who are subscribing to the treaty will be, I would say, uh, abiding by it. And those who do not subscribe, they will be not abiding by it. Any other questions? Yes, please. So, um... In one of your earlier slides, you describe the, uh, the process by which you have to go through to create your, uh, let's call it for the sake of argument, your AI model, which you can then engage with. So um, that looks to be an incredibly labor intensive uh, activity, and it also requires specialists to ensure that the, the results which we get from the neural network is ones which you have a high degree of confidence. And that also requires a lot of financial investments as well. Whether you buy that technology or whether you have it provided by a third party. So the question is this how soon do you see this technology being accessible and affordable to small to medium sized businesses up and down this country? So whether that's in retail, 
whether that's in manufacturing or whether that's even in financial services. So the bulk of British in British capability is around what are companies which are less than a So when will it be scaled down to that point? Yeah. So the question is the accessibility of the technology by SMEs in the UK. Well, the technology is there. Um, definitely, um, we have, you don't need to invest in a high performance computer. We have invested because this is a university and we are a research center, but you do not need to invest as an SME if you wanted to um, buy some time from the cloud, you can do that. However, nobody would advise you because you may end up by paying a lot of money because the uh, cloud providers are now, um, I would say, understanding uh, the, um, I would say, advantage of using this technology. So they have increased their prices. I, I believe, uh, and with regards to your question, when this is going to be mainstream or to be somehow democratized, probably in five to 10 years, when we, we have more competitors in the market, and when we reach a certain saturation in the hardware sector, that means we, no longer are able to um, produce new GPUs. This is one thing. The other thing, which I didn't touch on during this, but I touched on during previous sessions or previous talks, is quantum computing. The moment we have um, quantum computers used by the public, all of this becomes like a piece of cake. Um, Intel, a couple of weeks back, um, put into the market uh, the first quantum chip using quantum dots. This is a new technology of creating quantum computers. If this technology becomes available, and I say it's not if, it is there, when it becomes available, when it becomes like when you go and buy an iPad, similar to that, I think we would have reached that. And I believe this is gonna be in about five years time. But nevertheless, hiccups can happen. And this is why we, I, I was mentioning between five and 10 years. But I believe five years is a cutoff date for having a quantum computer at home. <clears throat> so, follow up question if I may. So, we're finding in the future, for the sake of argument, I've got a small engineering workshop and I've got a dozen lanes and milling machines, what have you. I've got a load of um, technicians and engineers that are heading off into retirement and I want to capture their knowledge of how they make a screw a bolt or what have you. Mm -hmm. So, in five years' time, me as a factory owner, how long would you imagine it would take for me to capture the knowledge that's in the minds of those people that are currently producing those nuts and bolts on those building machines? Okay, so the question is, how long it takes to capture the knowledge of my current workforce before that technology becomes available? So the answer to this is really, it depends. Um, human uh, resources is one of the most intricate, uh, I would say, domain in the market when you wanna try to capture the knowledge generated by your personnel and your staff. You need to have a system in place. You cannot do it by just asking somebody, please jot down what you do and go away. It doesn't work like that. You need to have a system in place and the best system would be is to be able to document the information and the knowledge. And for this to happen, um, some companies would implement enterprise resource management 
or they would implement some other systems which would help in documenting. I mean, other systems could be, and don't quote me for this, I, I can explain, ISO 27001, one of the security standards, but it could be um, somehow steered in a way to document information and knowledge. I'm not saying the, the standard itself is about documenting information and knowledge, but it could be steered in that direction. As I mentioned, ERP, ERM, all of these would help you. But the answer, to be honest, is it depends because you need to have the cultural change happening first. If the culture of the company is not ready for that type of documentation, you will not be able to capture that information. Other questions? Um, there's a one online from Andrew. I think he summarized it better. He said, you mentioned hallucination earlier. Can GPT know when it is hallucinating and helps? No. The question was about hallucination. Can GPT chat know when it is hallucinating? Unfortunately, no, because GPT does not have consciousness. They try to implement an auxiliary, uh, I would say, system to detect hallucination, but probably the, the success rate is not very high. So hallucination is unavoidable, basically. <clears throat> Other questions? How does the number of parameters relate to the intelligence of GPT? So something like, was it 240 million to that over a trillion? Chat brilliant, GPT? brilliant, good question. So the question is how the number of parameters would affect the, um, the number of, or, or, or the, the quality of the, of the information. As you can see that, the parameters are the weights that are attributed to the neural network. And the more we have weights, that means we have more findings. We have found more relationships, okay? The more you find relationships, the more you can deduce information. As simple as that. So, so there is, although it may not be an algebraic relationship, so it, it may not be a, um, a, a straight line curve, but the more you have, uh, but of course there is a correlation and the correlation is a more complex curve than, than a straight line curve, but um, eventually the, the more weights, that means you have detected more relationships, that means you can have more influences and you can have, you can generate new knowledge, more new knowledge. So it is correlated. But um, of course, the data cleaning phase is very important. So if you have lots of data and you have a huge number of parameters, but you missed part of the cleaning stage, your output is not gonna be that good. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> One, okay. Yeah, um, I'd be interested if you could elaborate on your research assistant, assistant box. I'm a student aerospace engineer. And so the idea of this um, AI that is um, centered around aviation knowledge is quite interesting as well. What sort of database does it pull from and what sort of stage of development is it currently at? Is it, is it something that I can see in my university in the next couple of years, or is it something I could see at work in the future? Right. So the question is, um, what type of data sources we we use for Hilda Rabot, which is our digital aviation, so to speak, chat GPT equivalent? Um, we we rely on different sources, sources that are internally generated 
or sources that are provided by other universities. So that's that's in a nutshell. Uh, if you are more interested uh, I'm, I'm to, to, to learn more, um, I'm happy to get in touch with you and probably uh, take this conversation further. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions? <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I think as um, the chair, I have to be the kill joy. Um, it's been a long evening already. And thank you, George, for you. sharing his expertise. And hopefully we all go away thinking about some of these and then be more interesting. I am an engineer. I definitely in AI when I was doing my PhD a good 13 years ago. I would say for your question, what I encourage you to do, do not look for a database, go back to the engineering first principles, because all this data is, to me, a lazy person's way to reconstruct the principles. <laughs> so if you know the basic principle, you can address your problem and understand why. So within this AI context, another fashion today in research is explainable AI. And why do they need explainable AI? Because people have taken the lazy approach, thumb something into a black box, have some solution and don't know why. If we go back to the original mathematics and engineering principles and understand what we see, why we see, I'm sure human is still going to be a lot more clever than computing rather than wasting a lot of kilowatts of energy to turn around things, to try to find pattern of something that we don't necessarily totally understand its source and its controlling parameters. Not that it can't speed something up, but I think without the first principles, we are probably going to kill the human race because of our laziness. <laughs> by the way, by the way, one of the data sources is going back to those principles. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah. one of those. One of those. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is where where uh, OpenAI is paying dearly for engineers and other researchers to generate the that kind of of data. Yeah.